The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advice professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can build a complete picture of your client's financial wealth. With NetWealth, you can track and monitor external bank accounts alongside residential and investment properties. Join the dots with Zeppo, a client data warehouse that connects your CRM and other tech systems with NetWealth. Discover a world of client data at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today we're talking tech stack audits, AI and cybersecurity with Deepal Khatri, Senior Consultant at Fenura Group. Deepal has an extensive banking background for over seven years at Westpac. She's worked through all the roles in financial planning before taking the plunge into technology and tech consulting. We chat about a real-life tech stack consolidation project, the conversations Fenura are having with the advice community, and the importance of looking at what you currently have first before adding more tech to the stack. I started by asking Deepal what the oldest piece of tech she still owns is and whether she still uses it. Okay, so it would have to be the first gen iPad from 2010, the original. Uh, Do I use it? No, I don't. Um, I tried to, uh, but I guess there's some limitations now. You know, you can't really um, download a lot of apps on there. So I have no idea where it is at the moment, but it is somewhere in the house. So I definitely still own it. Well, I don't use it. Wow. No, I th- and from memory, they were pretty thick, the uh, original iPad. They were. So I imagine it's, they were pretty chunky. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine it's sort of being used as a book or something to prop up a, a laptop or something like that. Probably, yeah. Or, or yeah, or my eight-year-old is probably doing something with it. It's in her toy room somewhere. All right. So is that – would you say that's probably um, – does that summarise your approach to tech, like the new thing comes out and you're straight onto it in terms of iPad version 1? No. No, no. So um, I will say I the only iPad we, we did upgrade to was, was for my little one for school purposes. Okay. So I myself am not an iPad user. I am an Apple user. So iPhone, yeah. I'm quite sort of committed to Apple in, in that regard. But I do tend to upgrade my phone, say, maybe every three to four years. Yeah. So um, I don't straight away jump onto the new thing. If I need it, if I need the upgrade, then I'm happy to make it. <laughs> nice. No, I'm also an, an Apple man. And just sort of on that, I think <laughs> next question is always around sort of AI in terms of one or two ways that you're using it. And I, I think Apple just announced a partnership with um, OpenAI, which is probably the next best thing yes. in terms of um, or yeah, bringing Siri into the current decade. But, yeah, are there one or two ways that you're using AI either personally or in your work life? Yeah, sure. So that's a good one. Uh, Siri. Okay. I, I do, you know, people forget about Siri now that we've got ChatGPT mm-hmm. taken on the world. Um, so Siri is quite useful, I guess, for, you know, normally when, when mostly in the kitchen for me as well, if I'm cooking and I need to set a timer, Siri is setting timers for me. It's, you know, doing conversions for me. If I'm following a recipe that's talking about, you know, ounces yeah. and I'm like, well, how many grams is this? <laughs> Who uses ounces? Um, so yeah, so that helps. Uh, chat GPT, I do use that, um, as well. Uh, I've been using it to help with my eight year old's homework, okay. uh, when it comes to match. I feel like the work they're doing right now, I definitely wasn't doing that level of, um, you know, maths back home in Fiji where I grew mm-hmm. up when, when I was eight. And then for work, uh, we do use, I do use chat GPT sometimes, you know, if I need to you know, rephrase something or just summarize, you know, um, an article or something. I try to, you know, get it to summarize it, take some key points and Copilot, which seems to be our best friend these days. So we do use Copilot for most of our team's meetings as well. Um, It's quite useful in, you know, 
to take act, um, summarizes the meeting for you and then, you know, key points. And then if we need to reference it down the track when we're doing some work, um, even say in PowerPoint or Word, mm -hmm. we can, yeah. So I find that te tends to work really well in the, the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I love it. No, that's plenty of examples. That's really cool. And just on that homework example, is that the, the sort of audio version of ChatGPT or is that the bit of combination with the written one as well? Oh. No, I've just been using the plain written okay. one. I don't have a paid yeah. sort of, yeah. So I haven't really played around with the audio. I have, I've seen a lot of good mm -hmm. examples of it. Um, but just sort of, you know, writing and getting it to explain certain like concepts. And I say explain it to an 80-year-old and then oh, that's within cool. seconds it's given me an outline, which which really helps. Um, yeah. yeah. No, the, the speed of response and the like the accuracy of what you need, even if you don't feel like you've given it enough context is always – often really impressive and just that yeah that co-pilot example of being able to I'm not say switch off in meetings but active like actively listen and not have to worry about madly taking notes or missing right. an action item I think that's really really powerful and also coming back think, to that meeting yeah, too. That's correct yeah and sorry that's been a game changer for me because I'm one of those like note takers so I'm like well I can't rely on my memory because yeah. I will never remember everything that was said in a meeting so um, I feel like, yeah, and I know, I mean, you know, Microsoft Teams always had the capability yeah. of you know, to type a transcription, record a meeting, but I think with now Copilot, it's, it's become a lot more powerful mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. Perfect. No, love that. And so today I'm really excited to get stuck into how you and the team at Fenura are uh, yeah, helping advice firms, what you're seeing with advice, tech stacks, the challenges that businesses are facing and obviously how you're helping them. Do you mind sort of starting with your origin story, how you came to join Fenora and how Fenora actually helps businesses? Yeah, so I guess my origin story began, um, I am originally from Fiji and I've got a banking background, so I worked with Westpac uh, for about seven years um, before moving to Brisbane and then I ventured into the financial planning space. So Started, you know, working as a client service officer and then client service manager and associates. So done all the different roles, and uh, and then I realised, you know, I wanted to uh, be more on the tech side and and you know the looking after the back end of the systems as opposed to being the front end user. And um, so that landed me my uh, role before Fenora, where a group of us, you know, we all worked together, and that was mainly around X Plan Consulting services that we were providing. And then when Finora, you know, so uh, co-directors, um, Aaron and Peter uh, started their company, there was an opportunity for um, me to move along there and work with them. So we had all previously worked together for a good part of seven years. And I think as Pete says, um, um, I think at Finora, all six of us, we've got combined about 150 years worth of experience in, in the financial planning spaces, you know, all of our experiences combined. Um yeah, so that's how sort of, yeah, um, started my journey at Fenar. No, amazing. And that, that just reminds me, I think there was a real estate agency in Tasmania or Hobart, where I'm from, where it was just a father and a son and it was combined 50 years experience. And I think the son had two and the father had 48, but that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Tiva. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I just, yeah, because I'm pretty sure it's over 150 no, years. It. You know, when you add up like how long everyone's been, um, I probably haven't, yeah, been in the industry about 13 years. So at least I can say, you know, I make up like the 13 yeah. years of, of the 150 um, and the rest of the team are doing the heavy lifting. Perfect. So at Finora, so we're all uh, working as technology consultants um, and in the financial services space. And most of our clients are sort of IFAs, licensees, and we do have a few institutional clients such as, you know, platforms and superannuation funds as well. And the key role we play is, um, you know, with our clients, it's helping them review their technology roadmaps just to, you know, so to do a stock take of what's available, what they're using, what's working, what's not working. And then we put together a bit of a roadmap for them. And then depending on, you know, their, their capability, if most clients will say, okay, well, we're happy with the roadmap and we've got the capability in-house to execute on this um, and to implement the changes, they'll go ahead and do that. Um, if they don't, then we also sort of help them to you know, move forward in terms of execution of those road, uh, roadmaps and sort of support them as well with that. Perfect. So at the very least you're doing, would you would you call it a tech stack audit? Is that is that what you would call it before? Yeah. 
Yes. So we do have a uh, tech health check that's available for free on our website. So generally, you know, we'll get them to also complete that just to see uh, where they're at at the moment in terms of their tech, uh, what they're using, what they're not, um, and, you know, what's working, what's not. And then we'll generally do a discovery session with the client and not just talk to the leadership team, yeah. but also, you know, their, um, the back office as well and just – the operation side of things as well, you know, because just to fully understand what their pain points are as well and what they're struggling with. And it's not so much always when we go in that, you know, we're going to change things. It's sometimes also just, you know, reviewing what they have and how well are they using it because there often would be times, you know, people have a CRM but they're not really aware of, you know, 70% of the things it can do. And so they're saying, oh, well, this isn't working for us. Um, and training is a key, um, sort of you know a key key part there. Yeah, no, it's an interesting, really interesting point about not using all the functionality within the tools that you already have. Uh, I'm just referencing the the Net Wealth Advice Tech Buyers Guide from last year, and I think it's about ninety percent of firms that are using the Microsoft suite. But then when you drill down into other bits of functionality, like in terms of what you're using for proposals. Um, for internal comms, like that percentage really quickly falls off. So, yes. yeah, have you got any comments on that in terms of using the tools that are already in front of you? I think we find, especially with the Microsoft suite as well, um, you know, often we find, yeah, people are paying for it and they don't realise what's all available. I mean, there are times when, you know, we've talked to um, people and they didn't even know your teams could do your transcription, yeah. you know, or record your meeting. Or, you know, there's something called the Microsoft Planner Board that you can use, you know, internally as well for like task yeah. management as well. And then there's the Microsoft Bookings. So, you know, we hear people go, oh, I don't have any, you know, a good booking tool. Well, like, well, that's with, it's it's included in your suite and you're paying for it and it's there for you to use. Yeah. So, I think a lot of people are familiar with the, you know, like for Microsoft, it's on my email, it's Word, Excel, PowerPoint and teams but then you know you've got people who have teams but are also paying for zoom and are using zoom for meetings oh definitely and i think we're definitely in that category and just with that that's such a simple example of microsoft planner like i've mentioned before but we we use that and then i got sort of sucked in by a shiny object syndrome and bought ClickUp, and then started doing it on there and then realized yeah. what are we doing like now you know, all of these sort of startups start out as, you know, free-only plans and they'll quickly push you into something yes. else and take away free functionality. So now we've just done a, a 360 or 180 rather and now back using Planner, which then integrates with Microsoft Planner. To Do, which just it just feels a lot more That's right. um, yeah, integrated. And it's all sort of now nicely yeah, available now even when you're in your emails, you know, and you can bring up your To Do and, and with your calendar and it's packaged all very nicely. Yep. And, and I'm with you because, you know, I'm the same. You see there's a new tool out there, um, but nine out of ten times you sign up for the free trial and you realise well, it's doing the exact same thing yep. that, you know, Planner or the other tool I have already is doing. Definitely. And I assume you're identifying that in – you mentioned the tech, the tech health check that businesses or anyone can do from your website. I actually um, did that the other day. It's actually incredibly detailed. Like it took me quite a while to get through it, but it also – um, yeah. It's not just a like a I don't know. One might think it might a, might be a glorified sort of lead magnet, but you give so many great tips and tricks and like a really comprehensive score. And at the very least, you ask yes. really hard hitting questions, like in terms of yes. uh, you know how much you're spending on your advice tech stack, as well as how long does it take to prepare and, right. and um, produce advice documents. Yeah. And um, speaking of the the, the spend, um, yeah, I think. Uh, there's a perception out there that, oh, you know, we're spending way too much, but we still find that, you know, a lot of the firms aren't spending as much as they okay. should. Um, so I think um, I was speaking just internally, we're having a chat. And so what we're saying is that, you know, a, a firm should be expected to spend somewhere between 8 to 10% of their total revenue yep. um, on technology in the future. And, um, you know, there's still the perception out there that, you know, tech – it's it's right. It's considered a cost and not an investment. Um, so yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, I'm with you. Like it, it's especially when we're thinking about investment in tech. It's it's looking at the you know people then look at the spend, then look at the current 
P&L uh, statement, but not thinking about that this is going to actually change the P&L in terms of this investment's going to actually improve the way we do things and that's right. just um, get us to where we want to go. So that's, yeah, I would yeah encourage anyone to, 100%. to do that tech health check at the very least to get um, a stand of where you are and you just, just those tips and tricks mm-hmm. are really, really valuable. So we've done the tech health check. We've had a, I assume it's a discovery call, as you mentioned. Let's, can we run yes. through maybe an example where you've helped a firm maybe recently and we'll go through maybe each sort of facet of an advice business from, you know, CRM and workflow, appointment scheduling, et cetera, and we'll try and tackle each, uh, I guess, topic or each function within the business and then we'll sort of go from there. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. No, that sounds good. And again, um, so when it comes to, you know, us working on this tech roadmaps, we, there is no, you know, um, one size fits all approach here. And, you know, we, we often find that, yes, there are some common CRMs out there. You know, we know X plan sort of features quite heavily, um, in, in most people's tech stacks and, um, you know, other, you know, your advisor logic, your midwinter. Um, but we often do find that. That every business is still different in terms of you know how many people are there, what sort of clients are you servicing, is it retail, is it wholesale, and what sort of capability you have in house as well. And so when we look at so as you mentioned, so you know we'll do the tech health check, and then we often do a discovery session with with the groups and go through and do a bit of a stock take of you know what they have. So for a client, for this client uh, that we worked with, they were using Microsoft, they were using Salesforce, Xplan, Lonsac, Morningstar, FileCloud, yes. and then all the investment platforms, right? And they also had a, you know, a managed service provider, like an IT provider. And then within, they had the Microsoft uh, suite as well. So they were using Word, they were using Excel, PowerPoint, um, and Zoom oh, wow. for comms and collaboration. Yes. And, um, and so again, for document storage and, you know, they were also using, um, file card to store the documents and that there was an integration there with Salesforce, but this was a, a fairly small business. So, um, and well, the size of the business, a solution like Salesforce was, was quite expensive. And, um, they were sort of outsourcing some other components, um, as I mentioned for IT and then they're also using DocuSign. And Adobe side. Oh my gosh! And then, so the key challenges they came to us with is just the high cost of, of tech for them. Uh, you know, in terms of they also had X plan in the mix, and they were just using very limited functionality of you know your Salesforce, your X plan, and um, none of that. None of the systems they were using was were quite integrating, and so there was a lot of like double handling, uh, reaching of data at different stages of the advice process as well. And they had already considered, you know, they had spoken to a lot of other various vendors that were out there and had some demos with them and just just were really sort of frustrated and a bit confused on, you know, what to do. Yep. So um, so when we kind of worked through, you know, uh, did a bit of a review, um, we ended up with uh, in, in a position where Advisor Logic was one of the solutions that we recommended purely because of the size of, of, of the business. And that also sort of ticked off, you know, because that advisor logic also has a revenue management system, the pay logic that integrates. And then Typeform. So I'm not sure if you've yeah. heard of Typeform, but, you know, yeah. So Typeform was another uh, solution, you know, we recommended for um, fact finding. Okay. So, you know, and then we sort of recommended uh, using Zapier to then push that data from Typeform into advisor logic. And, um, we also, because they also had some document, uh, DocuSign, yeah. sorry, and Adobe Sign. So it was like, okay, well, we're decommissioning your DocuSign and keep Adobe Sign because, again, that does integrate with Advisor mm-hmm. Logic. And because they were already paying for Microsoft um, Suite as well, you know, we recommended that they uh, use Microsoft Bookings and then move away from File Cloud uh, and move to SharePoint because, again, it's there and you're paying for that sort of solution. Um, so that was sort of, yeah, yeah. Uh, like yeah, a bit of an example. But again, like I said, so this was a more a retail, you know, uh, sort of offering. Yeah. 
And where we have, you know, clients who may have like a wholesale, um, you know, offering and high net wealth clients where there's not that requirement to produce SOAs, um, you know, for those clients, you know, we, we may look at a solution like HubSpot. And, um, you know, you've got Typeform again, mm-hmm. which we find is pretty good. Um, in terms of your, um, you know, integration with HubSpot as well. PandaDoc is another Ooh, yeah. one. I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, let's, yeah. let's tell so, listeners about that. It, that's one of the most, the cleanest looking sort of, um, it feels like a glorified PDF editor at times, but just the modular nature of it is really, it really fun and really great. And and again, yeah, so, you know, it it may be really good for someone who doesn't need to produce like a SOA yeah. or you're just working with more contracts and, you know, short documents and you want to provide that visual um, for your clients and that would, would, again, you know, that connects back to HubSpot. Um, and then Copilot, mm-hmm. you know, is, is something we're recommending um, to a lot of our clients. So, you know, if you want to, you know, we're talking about AI, but I guess the safest way mm-hmm. um, to play with it at the moment, um, Copilot will just sit nicely within your Microsoft ecosystem. Um, and I think if you look at uh you know, some of these AI tools that are upcoming and how they're priced. I feel Copilot is quite reasonably priced at, you know, I think it's USD $30 still, which would be Australian $45 yeah. uh, per user. And then some of the other tools, you know, that we've been seeing are $200, $250 per user out there. So I've seen like uh, Copilot is, is something we're definitely asking. Yeah people to yeah consider no that's a that's a great example thank you for uh, sharing and unpacking that i think yeah that business um like it, it must have been a real breath of fresh air to go through that consolidation exercise and just be able to go you know there aren't 12 systems that i need to log into on a daily basis i just made that number up there it's probably more yeah. actually but just the <laughs> the it feels like as well i'm just sort of picking up on the on the advice crm is it advisor logic that really is probably the only player that has that sort of ease of integration with tools like Zapier, which are really just ways to connect to other tools like Typeform? Yes. So as I understand, I think um, there is uh, work sorted is yep. another one. I believe. Yep. Um, I think you're right. Yep. That may also allow, but I think yeah. But at present, yeah, advisor logic is probably the the only one we see where that is you know using Zapier to kind of push. Um, yeah, yep. the data, and then yeah, you've obviously got the the uh, the double up there with the e signature tool, and then you've been able to make an easy decision on well, oh, let's pick the one that actually integrates with the tool that we're going for. Integrates exactly, and so you know that way we're not paying for two as well. And um, yeah, so we um, and also you know where people are using X Plan as well. So it's often um, you know that's really good where you know if you've already spent a lot of money, you've invested, you've got a, a wizard, you've got a document template that's working, um, and it probably just needs a, you know a few enhancements or tweaks to sort of work better. Um, then you know we would obviously you know, that's the direction yeah. we'll take. We'll just, you know, um, don't completely ditch that solution, like if it's yes. there and if it's working. Yeah, or, um, you know, your modelling tools as well. I think, yeah, X Tools Plus, I don't, you know, it's still a pretty, com- like one of the most comprehensive uh, modelling tools out yeah. there. Do you, do you have just on the, maybe the businesses that aren't ready to take the leap from uh, maybe from one financial planning advice um, tool or CRM to another. Do you see many that are maybe using X Plan for what it's really good at, and then using other tools alongside it? So maybe just using X Plan for modelling and advice document generation. Yes. So we've also yeah. So we've had cases, you know, scenarios where we've seen um, the X Plan is used mainly for your advice generation. So, you know, you're doing all your modeling, um, creating advice. And then uh, we've seen clients where you've got a work sorted, which, you know, you're doing your revenue management because it's simpler and for the size of the business, it works better. Yeah. Uh, you know, our revenue management uh, workflows also in work sorted. Okay. They're, they're pretty, you know, easy to build. Um, and then a client portal would be a my prosperity. Okay. So that's also another uh, sort of, you know, yeah, possible solution that yep. we've seen work. Um, yeah. And in, in that example with Advisor Logic and, for example, Typeform, My Prosperity wasn't a requirement or part of that 
part of the stack? No, because okay. in in that use case, yeah, that that wasn't I think even just the you know the number of clients they yes. were servicing as well. So sometimes you also need to sort of you know look at that. Um, and Typeform would would um, you know so they could still securely you know share documents with their clients through um, Advisor Logic's portal, um, and then also you know have a um, you know collect the data using Typeform as well. But in that sort of use case, yeah, we, you, they. The, their requirement wasn't there for um, yeah okay. uh, my prosperity solution. No, it makes yeah. makes sense. No, thank you for sharing that. And just to uh, like that all sounds incredible. And in my mind, as sort of a the technology person in our business, um, it's sort of done in my head. Once we've once we've implemented it, at least you know a working demo, or we've put it into a diagram of what the consolidation looks like. How does it? How do you approach the change management process with all of those tools consolidating into just a few? Yeah. So. Correct. Um, that is something, you know, we ensure that, you know, it's, it's sort of like a phased approach, right? Because, I mean, we're still mindful that people still have a business to run, you know, yes. they've got their day jobs and then kind of managing this whole process in the background and, and the disruption. So I think that's where we provide that support, um, you know, when we work with clients and then we'll sort of help them uh, translate the requirements or, you know, make sure that we're keeping the vendor, um, you know, accountable as okay. well throughout the process and just make sure that we, yeah, and that there's enough training and we sort of have a, a plan for them that we kind of assist them and, and I guess that's where we add the value because not um, often, you know, businesses will have the capacity or, you know, yeah. to, to be able to run something like this alongside their day-to-day business. Yeah. And then in that example, would you typically have maybe like a waterfall style approach where it's just one system being changed this week and then the next two weeks is something else or do you go, okay, next week everything's yeah. switching over? Yeah, so 100, 100, yeah no, 100%. So, you know, we sort of um, work with, yes, yeah, so if we're doing the, the key, you know, if you're handling the, the, the bigger beast or say if it's a CRM, um, then you phase out, you know, the next we'll look at the workflows building and then we'll look at the revenue management. Then we'll look at, you know, the portal if you're rolling out a portal. Um, so it, it's definitely in this, you know, the implementation could be like a six to 12 month yeah. process. Um, so just, yeah. And I think what also helps is when you are, you know, for, I guess for any business, when you are, you know, reviewing your technology and just, you know, you, you want to make a change, it's just involving everyone in the yeah in the organization so they feel like you know every, that they're, they're being heard you know and collectively you know you can identify what the sort of pain points are so once you've got a plan and you've communicated it there's that you know um yeah, yeah. you get a better result as well i guess in yeah. terms of rather than you know the top level making a decision that oh, all right well we're switching from you know salesforce to dynamics and everyone this is what you're doing yeah. next week um yeah so yeah no especially when you've got the people on the front line that are using those tools on a daily basis um and you mentioned before 100%. how you really engage them at the start too to make sure that you get the full the full picture rather than just what the the leaders of the business yes. are, are seeing they might just log into the you know the business intelligence tool and see a couple of slidey bars or dashboards and go yeah everything looks good let's okay. change it or let's change it so yeah, I really like that approach there because it, it requires a, a truckload of, of patience and persistence from everyone. It does. I've seen on, I think it's probably linked in in a couple of podcasts that um, the team at uh, Fenura are doing that AI is, you're positioning AI as a, a feature, not an actual product, which seems to be the case with a lot of Correct. things where it's just being built Correct. into existing tools just ah. to really get that tick that, yes, we do AI and we can say it in the, the AGM or the shareholder update. But what are you seeing in terms of the businesses that you're working with or the um, the conversations you're having with regard to AI, where it is now and where it's heading and how businesses can use it, I guess? Sure. So I think the conversations we're having are more about getting the foundational stuff yeah. right. Um, most of the businesses that we go into, you know, the, the, there's issues with, you know, advice implementation that's taking up to 60 days or, you know, producing a, a SOA plan that's taking them two days or three days um, or, you know, the client onboarding piece. Um, you know, we're seeing um, even, you know, cybersecurity. I mean, yep. we're in an era where people are still emailing you know, documents to their clients, um, you know, sensitive information is still being emailed. So I think what our approach is or, you know, what we're saying is 
get the foundational <laughs> things sorted first. And as you say, you know, we do believe that AI is a feature. So, you know, every app on my phone, I swear now, has the AI feature built in. So whilst, you know, it, it would be good, you know, to see um, our, our financial CRMs, you know, and the way they're headed, you know, having that inbuilt AI feature that helps helps you, you know, um, if you want to get an update on your client, um, you can quickly ask the AI assistant, you know, what's the valuation looking like or, yeah, I think that would be pretty cool to see that if, you know, that's where we land. But at present, our number one key advice we give is begin with a clear understanding of the specific challenges. So what problems are you trying to solve with AI? And once, you know, you've kind of identified that, use current technologies. So again, safest way to do this at, at present, we feel, is co-pilot. Uh, do not put client-sensitive data into chat GPT. Mm-hmm. So, you know, which which again, you know, because um, you may not be, you know, you may say that to your team, but you don't really know what's happening internally, how yep. many people are using the tool, what sort of data is going out and, you know. Um, and also sort of having some guardrails for AI use as well. So, you know, ethical guidelines, uh, you know, considering data security Mm -hmm. for, you know, and and quality control and also client transparency. So, make sure your clients know like how AI is being used in the services you're providing and, and you know, decision-making process, I think. So, you know, if my financial planner was using, you know, AI to like rebalance my portfolio or pick investments, you know, a bot's doing it, I would like to know. So, yeah, so we recently also um, just had a webinar that, you know, Finora has done some work with uh, Celine uh, from Tangelo Mm -hmm. and Fraser Jack from Cyber Collective and we've put together an AI usage framework. So just to sort of, you know, it's a free tool available again on the Cyber Collective website, Um, just a guidance for business on how to use AI safely and ethically and once you've decided to, you know, um, if you have implemented a solution, an AI solution, I think it's also good to monitor um, and, and make sure there aren't any sort of, you know, issues or inaccuracies. And then training and awareness, yeah. so staff training again around how to use this. Um, so, yeah, those are the sort of things we are talking yeah. about. But really, I think the problems we're seeing at the moment Um it's getting the foundational yeah. stuff right. Unfortunately, I don't think we're at that point where, you know, uh, AI is going to replace a power plan us or, you know, completely. Yeah, I just yep. well, personally, that's my opinion. Um, no, I'm with you. Yeah. And I think that the message is clear, like get your own house in order first and don't skip to yes. the – it's the new shiny object, isn't it, AI? It is. It is. And – and also what makes me nervous is, you know, if, if you're sharing, you know, you've got all your clients' confidential data and you're providing to another third-party tool, like what, where is the data being stored? Like where is it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that are, and at the rate I feel like things are escalating with AI and the changes, like I think you need to fully understand mm-hmm. it first before you go ahead and implement it. Um yeah. yeah, no, definitely. Just so you're doing it safely. I totally agree. And yeah, you referenced that um, that framework there in collaboration with was it Tangelo Consulting? I think we're actually, I think that was posted by our former host uh, Peter as well in the Ensemble community. And I think we're actually using that in our business as well. I don't think we actually are. So we're just finalizing okay. our own version yeah. of it. So I think that's incredibly beneficial and that's a great, great starting point to mm. um, to go from there and get that framework in place before you're actually using it in your business. That's true, yeah, and I'm sure that you know that document's just to start, and that will evolve as things change as well. But um, yeah, so I think um, Celine and Fraser from Cyber Collective with Peter have done a good job of putting that together. Definitely. So yeah, I guess in a similar vein, cybersecurity. I'd love to know the steps that you're taking as a business when you're working with with businesses, and also the conversations you're having there. We've obviously skipped straight to AI, but obviously cyber comes first, and we've just had a great conversation about um, what to look out for and, and the framework you should be putting in place. Sure. So, number one, <laughs> stop emailing documents to your clients because yeah. <laughs> um, we we see that happening all the time. And so, some of the you know, uh, I guess the three three you know tips i'd like to give is training cyber training for all staff 
I think, you know, that that's quite helpful in creating that awareness, um, you know, uh, with at Venera, we've just completed our um, ISO 2700 yep. um, one audit lately. Yeah, so, um, so you know, um, we've all got, done all our training as well. So, you know, I, I mean, it's it's a huge process, but it's it's a huge issue at the moment, you know. You, you keep hearing in the news, you know, it's an issue that makes your clients nervous as well with the amount of, you know, um, you know, password attacks yeah. and ransomware and phishing. Yeah, so I think creating that awareness, so just training. There's a lot of um, platforms available that, you know, offer training that you could uh, organize for your staff. And then when it comes to operational, I think how we share our data with clients and external stakeholders, you know, ensure that you're sharing your documents um, either using, you know, if you're using SharePoint um, or using a client portal and, you know, essentially a portal that's also got a um, e-signature capability as well because then, you know, that that will work well. Yep. And password management sort of protocols, I mean, I know it's quite common for people to share explain logins yeah. as well. Um, Especially for consolidating you know, systems the, and just yeah. keeping it for the, um, the one or two <laughs> ways that we're using. Yeah, so that that's um, um, that that should be a bit no, and you know I think uh, enabling multi-factor yeah. authentication should be mandated, yeah. you know, so sort of across all um, software. So I think they would be the three main ones yeah. uh, that that we often see. And again, you know, it's the small things that that will make the big impact as well, yeah. and those like quick wins you can, yeah. No, that's some um, really sobering, but also yeah, fantastic tips just to as part of yeah as we sort of discussed getting your your house in order first before we think about the bright shiny lights of AI and just on that in terms of speaking out password managers have you got any any alternatives to LastPass Dipal I've, I'm a bit over it to be honest oh. <laughs> oh I was just gonna say LastPass is the most okay, common one we we use um we use Zoho uh, here okay. at Finora as well and it's got its own little password manager called the Zoho Vault yep. So that that's sort of my other alternative. But again, we've got the yeah, people in the business also using uh, LastPass seems to be the most popular one. I think uh, I believe Norton. Okay. That they've got a password manager built in as well with, with as part of their package as well. Yeah, no, interesting. No, that's great. I haven't heard of like an integrated because Zoho obviously does a lot of things, and obviously they've branched out to password vaults as well. They, they do, yeah. So we um, use Zoho as well. We use Zoho campaigns here yeah. as well, you know, so it's a lot of marketing. So, you know, we, we used to use MailChimp and then we, when we moved to Zoho, it's like, well, why not utilize everything that comes with Zoho? So, um, yeah, they've, they've yeah. got a lot of good apps available. I mean, if you're a Zoho user, then, yeah, they've got your password manager. There's um, Zoho um campaigns as I mentioned and yeah bookkeeping yeah, nice. and there's like so invoicing and there's there's a lot of modules that got there. Yeah, interesting. Have you have you ever recommended that to a firm before? Because I know the former host of um this show actually uses that in their business and it works really well. I I don't believe uh we have. We just haven't had that use case okay. where, you know, we've had to, yeah. And as sort of I mentioned, like I think a lot of times our work is heavily involved um in just enhancing what they've got. You know, if it's working, then let's fix that. And then maybe just taking away, you know, some of the tools that aren't working or integrating and we'll throw something else, um, you know, that, that integrates better. But I don't, I don't believe yeah. we've... Yeah, we may have considered because sometimes, you know, we do yeah. Um, yeah, look at other alternate solutions out there, but nothing that comes at the top of my mind. Yeah, no, yeah. interesting. No, um, and yeah, Peter, we miss you. Uh, Dipal, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed the discussion. What's the best way to sort of progress the conversation? Yeah, sure. So um, with, you've got the our website. You can complete our tech health yep. check and get in touch with us. We've got a contact form there as well. Um, you know, if anyone's interested or would like to get in touch. Yeah. Perfect. Dipal, thank you so much for your time. Well, happy to contact me. Awesome.